And uh, we're going to move from the Telework Enhancement Act to the Plain Writing Act of 2010, still a relatively new requirement, set of requirements. And we're very uh, pleased to have with us today uh, Catherine Catania. Mm -hmm. And uh, Catherine is the co-chair, and I always need to be careful with this, uh, the Plain Language Action and Information Network, which has the acronym PLAIN, has to do with plain writing. Um, and um, I'm sure that, that uh, uh, Catherine is going to talk more about the plain organization, but let me just say that a lot of people think that um, that that is Catherine's job when actually um, she has another day job. Uh, she is an employee of the Department of Homeland Security, uh, Citizenship and Immigration Services, where appropriately enough she is a web content editor. Um, the Plain organization is a volunteer organization. It is an interagency um, federal organization, but made up of, of volunteers. So anyone in the, uh, in the group who has a penchant for plain writing, I'm sure the plain organization would be uh, looking for additional volunteers. But uh, Catherine is going to brief us on the requirements of the uh, Plain Writing Act of 2010. Catherine. Right. Thank you, Frank. Um, thank you, everybody, for having me here. Uh, how many people have heard of Plain? Good, good, good. How many people have attended a plain writing class taught by plain? Ooh, excellent. Very cool. Here's another question for you, and I'm waking you up after lunch. How many people have read a government document by your agency or another agency and thought, what does this mean? <laughs> All right, so that's why I'm here, right? I'm here to talk about the Plain Writing Act of 2010, uh, which is the most uh, you know, customer-friendly, audience-focused, common-sense thing that you guys could do. But for some reason, it's really hard for agencies to jump on this bandwagon. Um, and so I call it more of a cultural change in writing than anything. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk briefly about today, um, give you an overview of some resources, show you some uh, cost savings that plain language has helped some other agencies and states and, and uh, governments. Um, and you know, if you have questions, just shout them out. Uh, and you know, I'm, I'm always available for questions later on, and you can always find me at plainlanguage.gov. So, jump right in there. So, uh, Frank did a great job of explaining what Plain was, but we are a volunteer interagency working group. All right, so we have existed since the 90s, um, long before there was a Plain Writing Act, and it was basically just uh, writing enthusiasts that thought, hey, we can do a better job communicating um, to the public. You know, we're the government, we should be writing clearly. People should understand our message the first time we send it out to them. Um, and so these were the uh, folks that got together and they just started meeting once a month, um, and we still meet once a month. We meet the second Wednesday of every month. Uh, it'll be September 14th, the next one, and it's gonna be at GSA over at, um, First Street Northeast. So that'll all be on plainlanguage.gov. You can find information under our meeting section. Uh, we also have a listserv where we have over 300 and counting people who um, uh, you know join our listserv, get emails. Um, sometimes there's very healthy conversations about pronoun usage or you know what's the proper way to do something. It does drive you bonkers after a while, but if you like that stuff, it's great. <laughs> um, uh, and of course, OMB designated Plain as the official interagency working group uh, to help implement the Plain Writing Act of 2010. So I joke that my my third hat, because I have you know I have my regular job, and then I'm also the um, USCIS coordinator for Plain Language, so my internal to my agency. Um, and then of course I have my co-chairing, and I would say that's my voluntold hat that I'm here to to help all you because my name is an OMB memo. So. Uh, frightening stuff. It's fun, but also frightening. Oh gosh, everybody's emailing me now. Why are everyone calling me? <laughs> um, but we're, we're usually a nice bunch of people, and we, we love to come out to agencies and help you out um, with the Plain Writing Act. And I'll talk about that a little bit more at the end. Um, but more so on what is plain language, all right? Lots of people have a lot of myths about what plain language is, but basically it's just information that your audience can understand the first time they read or hear it. So when you get that letter in the mail, 
it should be clear, and you should say, I get this, I know what I'm supposed to do. You know, I don't have to reread it, I don't need to call up the help desk, I don't need to send you know, the, the web people an email going, I don't understand this direction, I don't know how to comply. You know, it should be clear, it should help your folks uh, find what they need, understand what they find, and use what they find to meet their needs. Right? It needs to have all the pieces in the puzzle. You can't just give them instructions, but write it in a different language, they won't get it, you know? You make it like IKEA instructions when you're trying to build a shelf and you, you actually build a chair because they're a little special. You know, you know it's instructions, but you're not quite sure. You know, I'm gonna get dinged by the IKEA people. It's okay. <laughs> All right, so why do we want to use plain language? It's common sense, we want to get our message out. We're trying to help the public accomplish something, either get benefits or understand um, you know, some kind of a requirement, um, you know, under, you know, uh, all the things like pay your taxes. Um, so we want to be as clear as possible and we want to make sure that we are improving compliance that we are having fewer complaints to answer, that we're producing less paper materials. You know, when people write back to you and they're confused, you usually have to write interpretive letters or redesign your web pages. Um, you know, it's a lot of tough stuff. And also, you want to uh, have more efficient use of your staff time. All right, and so if you're writing clearly on the front end, then you don't have to bother your staff with going back and redoing their work or giving it to another team. Um, you know, it, it actually saves you a lot of money. All right, so another reason to use plain language is it's the law, right? It is uh, the Plain Writing Act of 2010 requires all federal agencies to use plain language in public facing documents, right? Uh, and those documents are print and web docs that are needed to get a federal benefit or service, like filing taxes, provide information about benefits or services, explain how to comply with requirements administered or enforced by the federal government. All right, so that's basically anything that you write or put on your website needs to be in plain language, except for regulations, which is another story, and I'll get to that in another slide. Um, but um, what does your agency need to do? All right, now hopefully all of you have done this already because this was the um, July 13th deadline, and I have another slide about that, but you need to create a plain writing section of your web page. Uh, on your website or on your OpenGov page that explains that your agency is committed to writing clearly to the public and there's a public way that, or there is a feedback option for the public to get back to your agency when you are writing them gobbledygook, all right? So then they can say, hey, you wrote me this letter. I don't get it. You need to fix this letter. So that's what OMB wants to happen. So there's um, a discussion going on between the public and the agencies, all right? So if you don't have one yet or if you don't think you have one, check with uh, the powers that be at your agency because you need one and OMB will be touching base with your exec sec or with your secretary's office uh, to make sure you have one. Um, and of course you need to follow OMB issued guidance uh, which you can find on plainlanguage.gov if you don't have it. We have a whole page called Plain Language, it's the law. We have all the requirements there including the final guidance from OMB. Um, and OMB said you may follow the federal plain language guidelines. Um, and that means you don't need to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to write your own interpretation of what plain language is and that's really good because you don't want to do that. So we already have them up there. They're OMB blessed, you know, they like them. Uh, they're, you know, we have them in HTML, we have them in Word, we have them in PDF. So any kind of way you want them, that's great. And you can take them, you can steal them, you can use them, and insert your own agency examples. And this is the best thing for trainers ever. It's really simple. The key messages are there for all the techniques. And if you just use examples from your own agency, people say, hey, this does apply to the stuff we write. I can see how this works. Um, and that's what, that's what I did back in 2008 over at US Citizenship and Immigration Services. I said, you know, hey, there's these federal plain language guidelines. Why don't we just apply them to what we write? you know, for our immigrants and, and non-immigrants. And they said, oh, wow, that's weird. So we did it, and it's been working ever since. So you can do it too. All right, so plain language, it's the law. There's many things that you are supposed to be doing already, but uh, hopefully you are. Designate a senior official for plain writing. Uh, explain the act's requirements to your staff. Establish procedures to oversee the implementation of the act. Begin training agency staff in plain writing. Designate staff as points of contacts to the plain writing page. And post the compliance report uh, or compliance plan for meeting the requirements on your plain language page. All right, so probably all of your agencies are already doing that. Um, a cool thing that plain is doing, we're keeping con um, keeping order of all the different web pages and who your designated official is. So if you go to our web page and you don't see your people on there, let us know and, um, or tell your people and have them call us because we would love to put them up there. Um, and we're putting them up as OMB gets them as well. Right. 
So the act becomes effective on October 13, 2011. All right, so this is the, this is the big day. So what's going to happen on October 13, 2011? Everyone's going to magically write clearly, right? <laughs> no. All right, so um, on, on October 13, 2011, agencies must use plain language and facing documents and write annual compliance reports to OMB. All right, now the compliance report stuff is easy. That's on our, our webpage as well, plainlanguage.gov. We have a sample compliance report. Basically, you need to track how you're using plain language. Did you do um, a focus group and improve a, a series of letters? Did you do a focus group and improve a couple web pages? Um, are you getting better feedback from your customers on how you're writing? Um, do you have the 4C survey? Maybe they, survey, maybe they um, are writing better you know, feedback on how to find things on your website. Um, stuff like that. Did you change any forms? Are the forms now clearly written and people are complying with them better? That's the kind of stuff that OMB is looking for, just samples of how you're using it. They're also looking for how many people you're training. And I'll get into that in a little bit um, later. Because basically the act is very vague. It says train employees in plain writing. So it's like, who, which employees? Everybody? But we'll, we'll get to that. So I'll keep you on suspense. Um, let's see. But Obviously, OMB does not expect everybody to magically know how to write clearly on October 13th. They are just looking for you to start getting there, all right? Um, and we just had a, uh, a session for Plain. We have, you know, our monthly meetings are our August 1. OMB came and they actually answered questions. Um, and if you want that information, I can get it to you. I have a little cheat sheet of all their answers. Um, but basically, they just want to see that you're making progress, that you're not ignoring them, that you're actually going to move forward and try to write documents that work for your audience. Um, they also want to see you train your staff. So the more staff you train, the better. And obviously, if you train your writers first, that's the best way to go because they're the people that are, are writing to the public. Um, so I know lots of people come from agencies that have scientists, who have people who are just researching things, and those things might not get out to the public. So those people are kind of on the back end of who you would train. But folks who are writing your communication stuff, uh, you know, your policies that may go on your website, um, all those people, you know, your customer service division, those are the kind of people that really need to know how to write clearly for the public. And you, you may have different divisions that pop up depending on your agency that you're like, yeah, these people really need to get trained. All right. Okay, monitoring compliance. A lot of people say, who's, who's monitoring us? You know, why do we really need to do this? Well, OMB said they are definitely checking out agencies and seeing what they're doing and pinging different departments who aren't going to be complying or who don't think they're complying. Um, open Government Group is checking out all of the open government pages, seeing who has one, who has, you know, feedback opportunities for the public. Um, Congress has said that they are going to be monitoring um, agencies and may actually, you know, ping certain ones when uh, they are not complying. Um, of course, your agency-specific inspector general offices may be doing that, and of course, the public, because they can comment on your documents anytime um, or your website. So you know, if you're not writing clearly, you're already hearing from them when you don't write clearly. So it's not anything's really changing, you know, because I'm sure you already get nasty grams and, and inquiries going, I don't know what you guys are trying to say, because I know we get them, and everybody's not exempt from that. So. Um, Start your own program, and this is huge. You know, uh, it's a huge undertaking, but it's very doable. Um, I have 18,000 people in my agency, so that's U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. We have over 80 field offices, um, and it was completely overwhelming when I first started doing this in 2008. I said, I'm never going to be able to do this. We've now trained over 16% of the agency, which is pretty good, um, and we're getting there. Uh, we do it by. Uh, in-person class, webinar, video conference, and you know, just plain harassing people endlessly. <laughs> but it's a good type of harassing because it's you know, it's about how you communicate. Um, but in order to do that, you have to first make sure that your organization is all on the same page. And I know we talked about that earlier with the Teleworking Act. You know, make sure your managers are involved. Make sure it's high level. The same thing with this as well. Uh, make sure that everybody in your organization understands what plain language is, because there's going to be that one guy that stands up or one gal that stands up and goes, I don't want to write to eighth graders. I don't write to eighth graders. And you say, who, who, are you writing to eighth graders? Is that our audience? And then they go, no. And then you go, so why would we be writing to eighth graders? Because plain language is about communicating clearly to your audience. So if your audience is eighth graders, then you'd write to eighth graders. But it's not about readability levels and dumbing things down. It's about writing clearly to your audience, all right? Um, and not writing things gobbledygook just because it makes you look smarter. Because actually, writing gobbledygook makes you look pretentious and very dumb. 
So the clearer your message, the smarter you look. Uh, make sure that everybody in your organization is on the same page um, and that there is one training program for the entire agency. Uh, this is something that's very hard to do, but uh, you probably all know how silo projects pop up and then everybody's teaching their own thing. So make sure if you find some silo people, bring them back in, say, you know, hey, we all have to meet by webinar or you know, on the phone and be teaching the same thing. Um, identify key pain points. So basically, if you know that there's a document or a letter or a section of your website that's just horrible and you get repeated repeated uh, complaints about it. You know, fix that first. Fix the stuff that's really glaringly bad. All right? And of course, look for small successes and aim for bigger ones as you go because you can't start huge and, you know, expect success because that won't work. Um, but also the good thing about the Plain Writing Act is you only have to write clear documents going forward as of October 13th. So you don't have to revise everything you've already written which would be insane. So just going forward, uh, you know, rewrite your stuff. And I just got an email while I was sitting over there eating my turkey sandwich from someone saying, Catherine, do I have to rewrite the templates for our letters? Because, you know, we've already written the templates, but, you know, it's going forward, we need to be writing clearly. And I'm like, well, yeah, if your templates are all backwards and in gobbledygook, then yeah, you should probably rewrite those. But if they're pretty straightforward, then, then no. So, you know, just assess, assess what your major damage points are or places for improvement are. Um, of course, your program will fail without top-level success. Um, my program, uh, speaking with my second hat as a USCIS Plain Language Coordinator, um, was wibbly-wobbly at first because we didn't have a law behind it and it was just a best practice and it was common sense and you would think that people would be all for that. You know, we're going to be fo customer-focused and really try to write for people, but you know, no one showed up at class ever. We had like five people, eight people, um, and then we had to really just say, you know, this grassroots thing is working sort of, but we really need to get the uh, front office on, in on this. And you know, once we got memos out from the uh, director or little messages, we have like a, um, a little newsletter that goes out once a day saying this is what's happening. And we, we pepper that with, you know, the director says, write clearly. The re director doesn't like legalese. And then suddenly people start coming to class. So the good thing for you guys is you have the law behind you. So your senior officials should jump right on board and say, oh yeah, this is great. Um, you shouldn't really have to push them too much. Um, but of course you want to have uh, top level messages go out, I already said that, but uh, encourage managers to attend plain language class. That is huge and that is very difficult because managers are the number one problem for plain language class because people go, go to the class, they love it, they take it, they think it's fantastic and then they go back to their office and then their managers rewrite everything they did into gobbledygook. All right? Um, and I actually get that in all my emails. I love this class. I think it will be very useful in what I do. However, my manager will not actually accept this type, type of writing. Um, and I've been doing this since 2008, and I still get those messages today, and even though there is a law. Um, I also had um, a fellow go up to our Boston office and do a class, and they were just like, could you please just talk to her supervisor the whole time? And she was going in and out of the class, but she wasn't staying in there. And they're like, could you repeat that when she comes back? Please repeat that, because she's not going to let us do that. Um, so getting the managers their own class, or, or and I know it's tough because they don't have a lot of time, and they're running around. So I try to do it by doing short manager's briefings. We have a 20-minute manager's briefing that Plain put together. You can you know, borrow that. You can have us come and do it. Um, but just to get them involved, show them what's going on, tell them it's not bad for your, your, uh, you know, your employees to write clearly. Please let them write clearly. Um, and of course, have regular briefings uh, for your management. Um, other planning, planning tips, um, obviously you want to have classes as much as possible. Um, you know, once a quarter is great. Um, I'm a bit uh, overly obsessed with plain language, so I have uh, classes once a month where I come from. <laughs> but that is a little tough if you don't have trainers. Uh, but uh, you need to constantly reinforce um, that writing is important or people will forget about it. Um, and in-person classes are always the best, I feel, because it's hard for you to learn um, writing skills or relearn writing skills online pressing buttons. Um, but I know that with the advent of the act, there's going to be lots of different online training probably coming out and webinars and things like that. And those are all great. I'm not saying they're bad, but your writers really need in-person writing classes uh, because, you know, they really have to do practice. And all of our classes um, that Plain offers um, are very interactive. We do lots of writing examples, um, get people thinking and talking and you know, asking questions um, to try to actually practice the writing. Um, you know, offer classes to all your staff. Lots of people, you know, do have remote folks, um, so try to offer them um, there as well, even if you have to do them by webinar or video conference. Um, you know, 
create electronic writing guide. And that's why I was saying that we have the federal plain language guidelines. They already exist. You don't have to reinvent them. You can just grab those and kind of you know, condense them down and make them in a nice little format and you know, put your seal on them for your department and send them out. You know, Have them on the web page somewhere. Um, they're really helpful. People can use them um, as much as they want at their desk. Um, that's what we do at my place. Um, and of course, uh, make educational videos. Those are all great. Uh, if you go on plainlanguage.gov, you can see some of the videos that I've made. They're all on our homepage. Um, they actually take you to YouTube, so if it's blocked at work, then you can check it out later um, at home. But they're also on uscis.gov under our resources tab under USCIS videos, so you can watch them there as well. Um, and of course, create a recognition program. I can't speak. A recognition program. Um, this is something we did based off of National Institutes of Health. Uh, National Institutes of Health have a huge program every year where about 600 people attend and they have a guest speaker. Sometimes they have Nobel Prize winning authors. Now I know that's really above and beyond the call, but really cool. And they all get photos with the director depending on what they wrote. So they have the you know, best research project in the back. Woohoo! Very cool. Was it neat? It was neat. Mm -hmm. Did it make you feel proud about writing clearly? Excellent. It works. Give people awards, and it doesn't even have to be. You know, we don't have a budget for this. You know, we give people a little signed certificate by the director. You know, and they get a little picture, picture up. Um, you know, something like that. All right. So I mentioned before, you want to identify your writers. Definitely get them trained up first. Uh, focus on trouble documents. Uh, you don't need to rewrite everything. Improve your website. That's a key thing because that is the public face of your agency or most agencies. Um, and folks are coming to your website and they see how cruddy it is or how disorganized it is, they are going to complain. So, um, you know, if you have a chance, focus on that stuff. Um, and of course, make sure customer service is on board. We had that problem where customer service was doing something completely different than everybody else. We had to bring them all back together. Um, all right, so training resources. So, Plain offers. Uh, free half-day plain language training in person um, to any agency in the DC metro area. Um, if you want us to go elsewhere, we would love to go, but of course we're all volunteers and we have no budget and we have no staff, so if you have the money to send us someplace, we'd love to go. Um, you know, we're always up for an adventure. Um, and our classes, of course, are based on the federal plain language guidelines. Um, we have in-class exercises, and if you have documents you want us to use as examples, um, you can send them ahead of time and we'll, we'll try to work them into class. Um, and of course, GSA is working on a series of training webinars. Um, they're going to come out of uh, Web Managers University. Uh, and NIH has free online training available to everybody. Um, so there's lots of things going around. Um, and I'm sure there are other things in the works. Um, train the Trainer Boot Camp is something that Plain just uh, developed this year. Um, we had so many people coming out of the woodwork saying, well, I want to have a, a training class, or I want to have a plain language program in my agency, but I don't know how to train anybody to teach this. So we said, oh, well, we've been teaching this class since the 90s, so we should do a train the trainer thing. But once again, we're all volunteers, so we do it every other month. Um, well, right now we're doing it every other month. Um, but basically, uh, you come, you sit in a two-hour workshop, uh, you get to observe a veteran trainer at one of their upcoming classes, and then you can co-teach with that trainer or a different veteran trainer, and then we look, at, look, we look over your evals, we do a little mentoring, and then we're just like, okay, you know, you guys are good, you're good to go, you can train. And you can do that and just go back to your agency and train, because that does help us. Even though you're not training for us, that helps us because we don't have to come to your agency and train you guys later because you have in-house trainers. Um, and also, we'd love for you to join the playing training team if you wanted to and if your supervisor thought that was okay. So we're very flexible. Um, and playing trainers only train uh, at the, you know, at the, the whim of their supervisor. You know, you can train once or twice a, a year, um, you know, or something, whatever. Once a month, doesn't matter. Um, here we go. 
easy to understand regs. Uh, I briefly discuss this. I said regulations are exempted from the Plain Writing Act, but they are not exempt from three executive orders. Um, uh, the first one at the top, EO1356, which I don't have the number on there, is improving regulation and regulatory review. And that one just got signed by the president in the spring. And it said right in the top that our regulations must ensure that they are easy to understand and written in plain language. So I don't know if that's a better pitch uh, for plain language or not, but it definitely is. So um, plain language regs. Um, and of course, OMB wrote the best practices for federal agencies document, which is part of the EU rulemaking, and they had plain regulations in there as well. So we always pitch that your regulations uh, need to be clear because obviously folks who are not lawyers are going to enforce them. So if they're not clear, people can interpret them, and they may interpret them poorly, and then you may get lawsuit. So you know, write your regulations clear. Okay, so I went through all of those requirements. Any questions on requirements before I jump into benefits of plain language? There. Oh, forms are definitely included because they are public facing and people need to use them to get benefits or, uh, or anything, services. <laughs> Brilliant question. Uh, I have no idea. I can I cannot answer that one. <laughs> so I used to be in the regulation shop, and we used to send all the forms over there. So I, I feel your pain. Great. It's very tricky. Over there. It's the same exact thing. Congress decided to call it plain writing because they needed to change the word just because. It's plain language. Same thing. It, well, it includes everything that is going to be written that goes to the public. So you can still have grandiose, awesome speeches. <laughs> Anybody else? Um, and I always remember, plain language is about your audience. So I mean, I'm not here to say, oh, you must write C spot run sentences all the time. You know, it depends who you're writing for. And that's the, the biggest thing that people get hung up on. Like, I, I can't stand this. I don't want to write. Simply, I'm like, well, you know, sometimes sim simple is better, but uh, you know, it depends who your audience is. All right, so plain language makes sense to your audience, and it makes you sense, as in money, uh, when you use it. And plain language is used by corporations, state governments, federal agencies, and foreign governments. Um, in fact, I just went to an international plain language convention, and we got to hear from folks from Korea, South Africa, Australia, all of Europe, Scandinavia, Canada, and Mexico, um, Argentina and some other places as well. And it was fascinating to see that they all have the same problem that we have with government documents. So, you know, some, some worse than us, because you know, South Africa has 11 official languages, so it's kind of hard to write clear government documents. Um, all right, but here are some case studies in saving money. So Washington State has the biggest plain language program in the country. Um, it's been around for forever. Um, and they had something called use tax. And no one was voluntarily paying their use tax. It's a volunteer thing. They uh, wanted to uh, you know, triple. Uh, they, well, actually, I think they wanted to double it. And they tripled from 3 to 9%, the people voluntarily paying it. Their goal was 1.2 million. And they got 2 million extra in use tax. And it only cost them 1 cent for every dollar collected to redo their information on use tax that they sent out to people. $2 million. All right, Washington State, too. Driver's license. They rewrote a notice telling people their licenses had been suspended. All right, the hotline busy signals declined 95%, and each day, 850 more people reached the hotline instead of getting the busy signal. And three FTEs were transferred to help, in customers, help customers in other ways. All right, so you're saving resources. Canada, our great friends in Canada. They have the clear communication effort. All right, Canada's government clarified 92 different forms. All right, so they make a lot of forms each year. Uh, because there were fewer errors on the forms, processing time for government staff declined about 10 minutes for each form. And all the government saves about 10 FTEs each year in processing time. All they did was clear up the language on their forms. All right, and if you want more stats than these, I have them. Uh, Veteran Benefits Administration, they have an amazing plain language program, um, at least they used to, um, and they trained everybody in their agency through video conferencing. So they had one trainer in Philly, and then that trainer would be broadcast out to all of their um, you know, different uh, satellite offices, and they had coordinators in each spot teaching, helping facilitate the class. So that's an option, and if you want to talk to them, I know the gal who did that. Uh, so every several years, VBA sends out a letter to veterans asking to update their beneficiaries. 
Um, of course, if someone dies and they haven't done so, it costs the VA several thousands of dollars in uh, staff time to track people down. So they decide to rewrite their letter to you know, better explain why people need to uh, you know, mark a beneficiary. And after doing so, the response rate uh, jacked up from 43% to 65%, which is huge. And they uh, estimate they sell $5 million um, in staff time by not having them have to track down people and do lots of research. So good things. All right, Australia. All right, Law Reform Commission of Victoria rewrote old legal style court summons. Readers were better able to understand the requirements imposed on them. Compliance rate increased. And the government was able to reassign 26 police officers and other court officials to other jobs. Right? And Australia has a problem because they have the lowest literacy rate of any country, which you would not think, but they do. Um, and also they have the most natural disasters. So their, their version of FEMA has the hardest time trying to communicate to people. So they have really good um, tests in plain language um, for their, their agency. All right. So I've been talking all this time about plain language, but what, what do I mean when I'm talking about plain language? So there's key techniques that you can use in any document to improve the way you write. All right, and I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, all of them are in the federal plain language guidelines, but we're going to talk about identifying your audience, using active voice, keeping paragraphs and sentences short, and limiting jargon, legalese, and acronyms. And I'm sure you're familiar with all of these things. All right, so the hardest thing for government workers to do is to put themselves in the shoes of their audience because we have a mentality that we are writing for our supervisor or writing for our program office, and we just have to write stuff. We've got stuff to write, but you never stop and say, wait a minute. Why am I writing stuff? Who's it for? Why do those people need the information? What information do they really need? Do we need to give them six pages of stuff or do we only need to give them two pages because that's the relevant information that they need? And so it's all about stopping and putting yourself in the shoes of your audience. You wanna make sure what does your audience already know? Um, where are they coming from? Um, and what questions do they have? Because when you outline your document and the questions that people already have, it makes it much clearer when you write it, right? All right, here's the expert problem. Everybody says, I'm writing for very serious legal professionals and scientists and doctors and attorneys, and they don't run it simple. They want it very complex. These people are highly educated. I need to write as highly educated as possible to them. All right, now how many people in this room would consider themselves highly educated? or at least high, moderately educated? All right, and I'm gonna look very obnoxious. I mean, y'all, you know, whatever, but still. You had some schooling, right? Are you guys busy? How many people in this room are very, very busy? Very, very busy, yes. All right, do you like to trudge through documents that have very big legal words that aren't actual real words that are just legalese and complicated uh, phrases and different things just tacked on so you have a run-on sentence that goes on for like four paragraphs? How about those, you, you wanna read them? No, but you're all professionals. You're all very educated professionals. Don't you wanna read those? No. Well, neither do attorneys or doctors or, or brain, sci uh, brain surgeons like I have up here. Um, there have been several studies that attorneys take twice as long to translate legalese. No wonder they charge the clients by an hour. That's the same, you know, in any other, uh, you know, a, a profession. You know, you're just busy. You want the information that's important. You want to grab it and go. Now, if you're sitting there and you're leisurely reading a giant report, that's different. Or if you're writing a thesis, that's different. But if it's information to help you get benefits, understand requirements, um, or comply with something, you want to get the information and go. And you want it to be logically organized. All right? So, using active voice. All right, now active voice is one of my, my favorite things ever. And, I, and you can see my video when you, you go home and watch YouTube. But um, everybody in the government likes to write in passive voice because we don't like to say who's doing what. Because if we say who's doing what, people might understand that we did something. Don't <laughs> understand why we can't say that. Um, and I'll give you an example. Um, most of the letters that come out of where I work are, your application is hereby denied, period. But who denied my application? Well, it's on a USCIS letterhead, and it's for an immigration benefit, and USCIS is the sole official government you know, giver of immigration benefits, so why couldn't we say US Citizenship and Immigration Services has denied your application, or is denying your application, or denied your application? No, we have to say your application is denied, or hereby denied, which is, makes it sound even more important, because hereby adds a lot of value to the sentence, and we're gonna talk about hereby a little later. 
Um, so instead of new regulations were proposed, the Department of Transportation proposed new regulations. Um, now, are you going to use active voice all the time? Maybe not. 90% of the time, it's pretty good because you want to show who's doing what. You want to be transparent. Um, it was one of the first uh, memorandum that was signed by uh, President Obama. It was all about transparency. You want to be a transparent administration. You want to show who's doing what. All right. Uh, now, if the law is doing the action or if you don't know who's doing the action, then sure, passive voice makes sense. Or if you're on a working group and Sally really screwed up, she messed up everything, you go, mistakes were made. But you're not going to say, Sally made mistakes. You know, you're going you're to cover it up, right? Uh, all right, so let's do some examples together. So instead of it must be done, what would we say in active voice? Do it. Do, do it's good. <laughs> oh, it's going to do that. Huh? Oh, oh, no. You put the other one up. It's OK, Frank. Yes, but list up the PowerPoint. It's right. They used to pop up. But yes, do it. You must do it would be good. Or, you know. All right. A yellow submarine is lived in by us. <laughs> Exactly. We all live in a submarine. Song titles are the best things to, to switch into passive voice because they sound ridiculous. And so it makes you wonder, yeah, we kind of sound weird when we speak entirely in passive voice. Um, and of course, your application is hereby denied. Yes. No, well, that's, a, that's one of those agency preference kind of things. But we are denying would be the, the active voice for that. Or we denied, or you know, like that. You know, some people prefer different words. Denied is so harsh. But you know, it happens. Um, all right. So how about sentences like these? There is no escaping the fact that it is considered very important to note that a number of various available applicable studies, ipso facto, have generally identified the fact that additional appropriate nocturnal employment could usually keep juvenile adolescents off their affairs during the night hours, including but not limited to the time prior to midnight on weekends and or 2 a.m. on weekends. <laughs> what are we saying? Curfew. No, we're actually not saying curfew. Studies have shown that night employees There we go, yes. If this was the other PowerPoint, it would say uh, more night jobs would keep kids off streets, or more night jobs would keep youth off streets. So this is an example of how we write as government workers. We try to throw everything in the kitchen sink into one sentence, because the longer the sentence is and the more big words it has, the better it is, right? Not really. So you, you want to make a clear you know, introductory sentence and clear sentences throughout your paragraph that actually explain or express your, your uh, message. Because we want to write to communicate, not to impress. All right? And Thomas Jefferson did say the most valuable of talents is never using two words when one will do. All right? And that brings us to jargon. I know you guys are all familiar with jargon. I'm sure your agencies have their own very special jargon. Uh, but you want to make sure that you're using language that works for everybody. So there's proper legal terms of art that you can't get rid of, like plaintiff and habeas corpus. But then there's also things like hereby, wherefore, ab initio, intercesse, you know, all those good things that make no sense to anybody unless you get the dictionary out and you find them. So don't do that to other people. Just write things you know, clearly. Um, and if you do have an official term of art, you can use it. But you know, don't throw in random words that don't add value to your document. Um, and of course, you want to use language that your audience is familiar with. Um, like instead of using the patient is being given positive pressure ventilatory support, the patient is on a respirator. And that's something that we would understand. All right? And of course, define your acronyms. And I just have a random one from TSA up there. You may use your transportation worker identification credential TWIC at airport security or checkpoints. Um, and of course, you only have to define acronyms if you're using them again in the same document or on the same page. Um, and another thing that's very strange, um, some agencies have acronyms that are already clearly defined and very used in common you know, everyday things, like, um, what was it? It was uh, alcohol, tobacco, and trade before they, they turned into TTB. Had um, a COLA, and they had an FAA, and they had, uh, what was the other one? It was something really funny. But they didn't mean Federal Aviation Administration. They didn't mean cost of living expense. They meant something entirely different, which is extra complicated. Don't make up acronyms that already have common definitions, because you're just going to confuse everybody. 
All right, so next steps, now that I babbled at you um, for this time, you know, you want to make sure that your agency is complying with the act because it's legit, it's a law, um, and October 13th is around the corner. Um, so make sure, you know, your agency has a plain writing uh, official web page implementation plan. I know you guys are all trainers, so you're focused on training. Make sure you're starting to train your agencies, uh, agency staff um, and come up with different creative ways to do it. There's no right or wrong way to do it. You just need to get people thinking about the way they write. You know, how can we... Uh, improve the way we communicate with our public, all right? Because you want to, you know, obviously put a good face uh, on when you're, you're communicating with folks outside of your agency. And also to other agencies, because um, OMB has defined public as your external stakeholders. So say you're an agency that speaks to another government agency, they might not understand your internal jargon um, either. You know, they might be completely confused by your acronym. So make sure you're writing clearly to them as well. Um, and of course, you could visit plainlanguage.gov whenever you want. We have lots of great resources and best practices from other agencies. Uh, we have a lot of training materials that you can just swipe from us. You know, we're not, you know, we're not, we're not picky. Just you know, say, hey, we got this from Plain. You know, and you can use it. Uh, and of course, uh, we have the uh, federal plain language guidelines. And we'd be happy if you want to join Plain. And of course, we're always looking for volunteer trainers or volunteer agencies to. Um, How's a meeting? You know, we have meetings uh, the second Wednesday every month. So, if you have a meeting space and you'd like us to come, um, we definitely like to show up. And if you'd like to present at a meeting, you know, you know, sometimes people like NIH would come or FAA would come and they say, "Hey, this is what we're doing um, for our plain language program, and this is what's working for us." Uh, we even have forums sometime where we had FAA. Veterans of Benefits and myself, and we all talked about what our individual programs were doing at our agencies. Um, so we try to always have very positive, um, helpful meetings for everybody to get best practices and, and talk about challenges and things like that. Because this is, isn't easy. It seems easy, but you know, it's not. You know, because you're talking about how people write and people get sensitive. Um, but in the long run, it's a really good change, and hopefully, everybody jumps on board, and the public can really benefit um, from how we're communicating. And of course, we can benefit because it saves us time and money if they get what we're trying to say the first time we write it. All right? Any questions? In the back. I try to avoid grammar at all costs. There's, a, I feel like the plain language class should not be a grammar course. There needs to, they need to be separated because once you get into grammar, then the whole class gets very picky. You have two people: the people that are really excited to talk about grammar, and the people that completely tune out and they're like, "I'm having flashbacks from eighth grade." La 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 la. Um, so when I teach, when we teach our classes for plain, we don't touch on grammar at all. I think we t we touch briefly on word placement, and that's only like one slide. Um, you know, make sure you put, you're putting your conditionals next to the words they actually modify. But we don't uh, go into to specific grammar information. It's just the basic techniques on how to improve your writing. Does that answer that, or did I? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well. Oh, yeah, um, go to plainlanguage.gov, and it, uh, there's a little blue column on the left, and uh, it says uh, join boot camp. Um, and then you just fill out a little form, and it'll instantly, like, um, you'll actually get an auto-reply from me. Like, you'll think, oh, Catherine's just doing anything, but sitting here typing this giant letter. But it, um, I've had people call me, like, Catherine, you just wrote me this great letter. And I'm like, no, I didn't. And it was auto-reply. I should just see, yes, yes, I did. Um, and we'll, we'll put you on an Outlook message for, like, the next class. We'll say, you know, you're signed up for this class. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me, and good luck. Thank you very much. <clears throat> very engaging presentation, Catherine. Thank you. Uh, on a subject that sometimes you know, cannot is not always that interesting. Um, I would mention, uh, Jack mentioned uh, that the graduate school has a writing curriculum. And, and I'll just mention for what it's worth that we also do have a, um, we also do have plain writing uh, courses. 
it, it makes sense to use the ones that are offered without, uh, without cost, makes perfect sense if you can get those. I would use the same analogy, I don't know if Catherine would agree with me, that they used on the um, telework uh, training this morning, uh, that uh, the, the ones that are available without cost are great, high quality. If you need something that's customized to your agency, your particular situation, you might want to uh, consider the graduate school. I remember uh, uh, one instance we had recently uh, where this came up, and uh, uh, I won't mention any particular agency, but the agency approached us, and the, the target audience was very high-level officials. And there was great sensitivity in the agency about telling these officials that they needed writing training. And um, turned out they had been hired in another capacity, I think it was law enforcement actually, and over the years had been, you know, something had happened within the agency, they wound up in jobs where they had to write. And, but they didn't want, the agency didn't want to tell them that um, they needed writing uh, training. So I, I think we did something crazy like we said it was management analysis. <laughs> and how to write a management analysis report. But it still came out to be the, the writing training. So if your agency has a, a need for something special or something customized, um, you, you know, it, uh, we'd, we'd appreciate it if you would keep the uh, graduate school in mind. 